Welcome to week nine. It is markets and marketplaces. You know the drill. Let's get onto it. What we're interested in making certain we're covering this week is that we are checking in on key theories that we are thinking as we are working our way through this, not just how can I use it, but how would I describe it from a marketing perspective? And this is the week in which distribution theory gets its very own application set. As we look at how you would use an intermediary as a platform for distributing your product to your audience. Now, one of the things I will say is that if you set out to use Etsy or eBay or Depop or one of the smaller brokerages, then that has implications throughout this section. Also, we have a number of other elements we've talked about in different sections. So Redbubble and Bandcamp would equally show up as markets and marketplaces. It's important to think uh, about e-marketing terms of sometimes we'll use a case example because it's got a really good illustrative point, but that doesn't mean that it is just isolated to that section. We teach in incremental blocks, but reality works as a heavily cross-wired medium. Theories of note and things you want to be thinking about. Because it's a market, Therefore, there is a distribution channel involved. Therefore, we are looking at distribution theory. That opens up SIVA in terms of access, but also can open up SIVA in terms of information. How do I learn about the product that I want to use? Can I learn about it through the marketplace where I'm going to purchase it from? We also open up positioning strategies when we start thinking about the way in which distribution and when we're looking at a platform like eBay, where there are subcategories, where we're looking at Etsy, where there are subcategories, and you can position within a category against competitive alternatives. We open up retail in theory, because we start thinking about how does a market space get to borrow from theories that describe how physical world environments work. So we can start thinking about retail clustering from an internet perspective of do you set yourself out on your own website and run your own uh, Shopify account with a PayPal transaction cart or do you join up to one of the bigger brokerages and work where you know there's more competition but equally there's more traffic. So markets and marketplaces are also an area where it's important to consider that, well, historically, the internet was supposed to replace the intermediary. The idea was we would go to that flat distribution of direct customer to manufacturer. This turned out not to be as practical as previously imagined, and it was pretty imaginary when it started. What happened is that the internet gave rise to the super intermediary. Amazon.com is an intermediary. It is a wholesaler, retailer, manufacturer, brokerage. It is a giant monstrosity. It's also an evil entity and it should pay its workers better and it is proof that humanity needs an upgrade patch because we shouldn't accept the cruelty by design that is Amazon's workplace environment. But the market and marketplace, the intermediary was supposed to be wiped out by the internet. The intermediary became more powerful because of the internet, because it was harder to find specific things, but also because economies of scale still happen and that it is easier to buy one item from a wholesaler and one item from a retailer than it is to buy one item from a manufacturer who normally ships 144 of these things to a wholesaler who breaks it down into 12 by 12 units for 12 different retailers. Going direct to the source was not always the best solution. It still is available, so going direct rather than going through an intermediary, but here what we're going to look at is the intermediaries. Which also means that there's one other footnote. A function like Shopify where you embed a shopping cart on your site and the transaction is maintained by another, by the Shopify 
servers. That is software as service, that is an embedded service. It is not necessarily a market. The next idea I want to bring to your attention is the 1990 rule. Now this rule came from Wikipedia. And it's a rough rule of thumb. It's up there with the Pareto 80-20. Wikipedia's rough rule of thumb is that 1% of its traffic comes from, or so 1% of its user base creates content. 9% of its content, or 9% of its user base creates through editing. The co-creation of value comes from the improvement of what the 1% originates. And 90% of the user base is what we call the audience. This is really important because this is 1% is the creator, 9% is the contributor, and 90% of the people for whom the 1% creates. What you are looking at here when you take this across to the market to the marketplace is the understanding that the majority of users and traffic to a marketplace are buyers, shoppers. You as a creator of content who goes and uses a marketplace for the distribution, you are a very small portion. You are the traffic incentive. You are the reason why people come to the brokerage in the first place, but you are not the normal usage pattern. Consequence of which is that it's easy to fall into the trap of forgetting that as the outsider anomaly, you may drive some of the reason for this existing, but your core business is about getting that 90%, getting that audience. And this comes across in a whole bunch of other places as well, in terms of someone creates, someone kicks it off, someone else enhances, and that enhance can be reply. There's a whole bunch of other theories under the hood here that um, you should be familiar with. First mover advantage versus second mover advantage. Creators have first mover advantage. Contributors have second mover advantage. The whole notion of the innovation adoption cycle ties nicely that the creators are more likely to be the innovators, it's more likely to be innovative. The contributors are more likely to be people in positions of social authority as editors and improvers and enhancers. So they are more likely to be in your early, uh, early adopter camp. The numbers don't match perfectly, but what does match is the bulk of the population is early majority or late majority, looking for leadership, looking to follow. And that's what an audience, an audience wants to watch, an audience wants to consume, and that's what makes them so valuable. Also, hey, um, love having audiences. Audiences are really important and we should respect them. Now, one of the things about the 1990 rules, it's often misunderstood as being a dismissive. Or often it's used dismissively, like, huh, look at them common people who don't create things. It's like, look at us weirdos who create stuff. We are the anomaly. We are the one that the Matrix was designed to boot out as it rebooted and went, wow, system error. Thanks, Neo. We are not standard issue. If we're creators, we're not standard issue. And over the course of this semester, I have tried to drag you from audience to creator. I put you in the anomaly box. Welcome aboard, glad to have you on board. And also think about the size of this subject and the fact that I'm not aiming for 90% of the subject to be audience. I'm dragging most of you up to be creators and some of you to be contributors. But also it makes the forum make a lot more sense now, doesn't it? All right, what determines if it's something is a market or a marketplace? Basically, is it a brokerage point? Is it a point where a provider can use the site to reach an audience, to sell, to offer something of value. Uh, so shop fronts, brokerages, auction houses, business to business marketplaces, print on demand, suppliers. So there's a bunch of different ways. Really what you're looking at here is there's not a there's not a lot of technical on the definition here. It's more a case of if you are self-service selling, if you are 
you make it and then you sell it off your own website, you're less likely to be a shopfront. But if you make it and sell it out of your own website and you sell the product of other people, yeah, you're a shopfront. This is how Steam gets to have um, the category of being a shopfront because that software originated as a security mechanism for Half-Life 2. Half-Life 2 gave us Counter-Strike Go and Steam gradually went from a copyright protection mechanism into a full-fledged factory warehouse of digital content. It's kind of weird watching the evolution. All right, what's the offering that has value in the marketplace? And there's a business to consumer and a business to business. And what we need you to think about here is for your perspective, are you using a marketplace as a consumer? And for which I use AliExpress quite a bit as a prosumer. I buy elements from AliExpress to use in my YouTube production. For the upcoming season two, upcoming at time of recording this lecture, I have shopped at AliExpress to buy myself a range of parts for an ongoing recurring sketch. And therefore, the value offer is the capacity to think of an idea, search for the parts for that idea, and then be able to add all of them into the cart and hit the one button. So I haven't had to negotiate directly with 17 different suppliers. I've had one port of interface. So I've had a massive convenience value there. It is very easy for me to spend too much money on the pursuit of this. As a business to consumer, so there's a B2B aspect here because I'm going for assumption because I'm buying this to use it. Uh, similarly, Envato is a marketplace. The only difference with Envato is that I pay a subscription fee that is a flat rate to per, rather than a per purchase. That puts it on the cusp of marketplace, but I'll count it for purpose. So let's get into the business to business marketplace and have a bit of a look around. This is where we also pull up the retail distribution strategy from a business to business perspective. Intensive, selective and exclusive are very familiar terms to us from base marketing theory. What we want to think about is what does our audience seek? What is it that our audience is looking for? And what does that do to inform our retail distribution theory, which then informs our selection of online marketplace? Case in point, exclusivity. If you are going to go for a prestige uh, pricing, prestige product, or an exclusivity approach, then you need to narrow the point of purchase. You need to make it difficult to acquire your product. So actually capturing the product becomes an item of value. It becomes a task, a challenge. It is a hedonic experience to get out and find and buy this particular product. Equally, if you are going the other end of the approach, the intensive channels, you want to make certain that you are covered on your key market points. And that can mean a listing on Amazon, your own listing on eBay, plus being able to be listed on retail outlets around different suppliers. So this is another consideration here as well, is that as a manufacturer, if you are going to do this from a business to business perspective, if you are creating physical goods or digital goods, and you are making those digital goods available over the internet, an exclusive, and I'm going to take video games for a second here, as an independent, and I know a couple of independent um, game developers who I follow on Twitter, they have a choice. They can publish through Steam, they can publish through Itch.io, through Amazon, uh, Epic, and there's a couple of other ports. Uh, GOG, Grand Old Games, Good Old Games. Also, if they do print media versions of their games, then they can go through GameStop and EB Games and 
a series of other platforms, including eBay and Amazon. What you need to decide is exclusivity or intensive. Where is it best for you? Now, as most of the projects here probably are in early startup, you probably would get away with exclusivity just on the ease to which uh, managing and wrangling a retail distribution strategy of, I will do print on demand content for my project and I will put it through Zazzle or Redbubble versus I will do print on demand for my project. I will print a hundred shirts through Vistaprint. I will stockpile them in my room and I will sell them off the back of my website and three other websites selective. It's the strategy. Inform your distribution strategy is also informed by your other strategic considerations. If you are only available on Instagram, you are exclusive to Instagram and you then look for what can the Instagram shop buy now button support that will choose your platform and that will enable you to go by a choice I've made earlier. I will find it easier to make a future decision. Uh, pricing and marketplaces. Okay, this gets interesting. So we're going to flip it from the perspective of as a user of a marketplace. What is a free listing? Now, most of the time free in the marketplace sense is you are paying a commission on sale or it's a print on demand service. You are doing a revenue split. So you don't have to pay anything up front to put your work into the system. However, the system accepts a certain level of risk of hosting you in return for a cut of the operational, a profit over the cost of operation. This is where we get to areas such as freemium, where you can buy in additional features like <sighs> curse it, Etsy and its uh, paid product listings. If you see an ad sponsored ad for an Etsy product, don't click the sponsorship link. Don't click the advertising link. Etsy has had a very dark history of going and advertising without telling people they were being advertised and then charging them saying, oh, by the way, we brought 50 new customers to your site. We're charging you $75 for the privilege. You didn't sell anything, but we're still, we're, we're charging you for the, the privilege of being in the advertised sponsored link. Dumb business model, bad business model, but supported by a bunch of people who don't actually go to Etsy and buy things from Etsy, but are bankrolling Etsy as investors. Other things such as premium buys you additional things like uh, service fees, transaction fees, advertising, better listings. If you go to What If, which is a retail outlet for hotels, if you haven't been to whatif.com, you'll notice that the search results can be influenced by people paying money. Uh, the mates rates and the special deals are all about the people doing the listing on the site using premium. And the last thing is that you quite often will find if you want to self-service your own market and create your own market space, you're paying a subscription fee uh, to set up and maintain your shopping cart and your uh, infrastructure. And quite often there is a small premium per transaction as well. So there is costs to sell things. And that includes in the digital space. Uh, digital River is a broker of software. They will let you set any price, but they will charge you for the things that you sell. All right, non-financial price considerations uh, in, pro in terms of production. Now, I've got a bit of a mix here. I've thought both consumer and production in terms of price, but I want to talk about as a user of a service. Now, I use Vistaprint <laughs> quite a lot. Uh, I've got 50 something shirts for my YouTube project. Financial price, I'm waiting for them to have another sale before I buy any more stuff from them because I spent I spent enough money to be assigned a personal manager, at which point in time I realized I was spending too much money at Vistaprint. If they hadn't assigned me someone to manage the sales account, I would still have bought more stuff between the point in time the sales manager was assigned and now. But as soon as they assigned a sales manager, I was like, Okay, so this was actually lifestyle. 
they upped the lifestyle price of my engagement with their platform because I felt I shifted category. I felt I moved from being a guy who makes stuff for himself and posts things on and buy stuff off um, Vistaprint to when I got told, oh, hey, I'm your sales manager and I'm just here to see if there's anything we can do to help. It changed the social dynamic I had. It changed my dynamic with it and moved it out of my comfort zone and moved it out, increased my risk level and increased my lifestyle level which is exactly the opposite of what they wanted to do. They wanted me to spend more money and effectively they caused me to save money. So be mindful of that when you go down the road of not everybody wants a personal relationship with the company they're spending money at. Time price. Let's talk about when you make something and you're using a retail outlet and you're going through that. Uh, time is an expensive cost here. Also, there are some brokerage issues around the product is sold, the money goes into escrow, the money is held, the money then goes to the brokerage, the brokerage holds it for 60 to 90 days expecting a charge back, expecting a refund to be asked for. At the end of the 90 days, the brokerage then goes, do we have enough money to warrant running a check for you? I really hate services that still do this. There's no reason for you to do this. Do, is there, have you reached your minimum threshold? The minimum threshold here is a dodgy as hell financial accounting thing that allows companies to effectively steal money from small um, providers and small business operators in there that instead of paying them directly when the money comes in, they get to stockpile a whole bunch of stuff they can save in their accounts. And that has an unethical business conduct. And I don't care if it's good accounting. It's bad marketing. The time lapse between the sale made and the payment going to the person who created the content that generated the sale. The longer that is, the more likely it is that the artist involved won't be able to sustain being an artist, which given they were the reason the transaction transpired, you want to have an ecosystem that pays your artists quickly. So your artists make content that drives people to want to buy from the marketplace. Similarly, uh, effort, literally effort. The challenge of a marketplace is the level of complexity reduction versus complexity maintenance. If you are running a marketplace, for example, like Bandcamp, where it's simple for me to upload the files, set a price on them, and then your software takes over and handles the rest, your brokerage fee is basically me paying for effort reduction. Equally though, if I have to then, I upload the files, I set all the things up, and you sell a ticket, and I then have to mail it to do all the other things in the back end infrastructure, don't charge me a premium for the pain I'm experiencing. The cost can also be quite high. And one of the things, uh, a logistics thing I see a lot on Kickstarter is, when someone has a catastrophic success and they suddenly find themselves needing to mail out 10,000 items and their local post office is like, we have a cap of 500 units per day. And the less than local post offices are like, who are you and why shouldn't we be calling the FBI at this point because you're showing up with all these boxes that you're trying to ship to somewhere, alert, alert. So there can be those uh, effort costs time costs and other aspects of when you have a brokerage takes the sales and then you are responsible for the final transaction fulfillment. Last thing on this in terms of market spaces and marketplaces is that there is a risk involved in being part of a channel because the channel can do something stupid and brand damaging. Uh, everyone who was on Substack, now Substack isn't necessarily a retail outlet of words, but everyone who was using a service like Substack, where Substack then went and aligned itself with a bunch of fascists. And if you weren't a fascist who was on Substack, suddenly you're like, there goes the brand. There goes my marketplace. So every time Amazon goes out and does something horrific and murders 
employees in their warehouses, every time Etsy goes out and does something stupid in terms of banning content, every time a distribution channel harms its brand, it also harms the people attached to it. So there is a risk when you are tying to an exclusivity channel that the channel could do something stupid. All right, distribution by product. Welcome to the distribution challenge. Uh, basically here we're thinking about a wholesale retail outlet approach. Uh, look, I'm gonna say from the top, most of the time we're thinking about this is we're thinking about digital tangible, where a file is served to you. Uh, we're thinking about digital convertibles, convertible and tangibles, where a file is just, there is a warehouse stockpile, digital stockpile of things that you then go and create. Then there's the intermediaries where a person uploads a file that can be purchased, bought, and then processed by a third party. Shapeways does a good job there. In the physical objects got to go from place to place. Uh, things like Depop, uh, the closets, a few other places where buying, you transact, you, your brokerage is transacting the finance, it's doing the sale, it's advertising the material, but at the end of the day, it is you, the person who's running the account, who sticks the stuff in the mail and posts it. Compare that to something like the digital like drop shipping or using AliExpress through, or using Alibaba, the wholesaler platform, through AliExpress, the retailer platform, and also doing drop shipping through aspects such as eBay. Now, drop shipping is something I've mentioned a couple of times in passing. The idea is that you put, you advertise for sale goods that you don't currently own. When a sale is made, you then through manual or automated systems, go to buy that off a wholesaler somewhere. Um, there are a range of services that facilitate and broker this. Basically, there's a risk involved there that the price you receive from the consumer is not enough to cover the cost of acquisition. Uh, for the most part, we do this, there's, you see a lot of this on eBay where there's the same product and it's like 35 different retailers of slightly different names selling the same object. Dropshipping is a thing. Um, it varies in its success and profitability. I know that I've had students in the past from this subject have had successes in doing it prior to coming to us. Uh, it's just too fast, this 10 week period, to really get a good dropshipping enterprise up and running but it's something you can consider down the track. And the last distribution, wholesaling, retailing, and shifting of content is if you want to be a provider of content that is run through one of these other brokerages. Uh, there are some sort of brokerage services that run direct and it's per item artifact purchasing, like your Shutterstocks or your Ichio. And there are some which are much more, it's a brokerage and you get a fee the consumer pays a flat fee, but you get a revenue per time your stuff is used. Business to consumer side, I want to just briefly mention this on the way past. Um, this is a very important facet for you to consider from the SIVA perspective. The cost of free. Free shipping. <laughs> you mean shipping where the cost was embedded in another part of the purchase. Free shipping over dollars n. Well, we're making enough profit that we can pick up the tab. Premium. Welcome. Hello, Amazon. You will pay for express shipping. And then my favorite, which is you buy enough crap from us that we can sell you a subscription because we know that you're buying at least once a month between now and the subscription renewing. I would love to... I would really love to cast judgment here, except when I was living in Canada for six months, I had an Amazon Prime shipping because I was buying that much crap from Amazon. Can I just say, when you are attached to the mainland of America by road, Amazon becomes really, really addictive. All right, consumer focused non-financial price considerations. Uh, functional risk and financial risk. There is a massive Shopify fake shop problem. 
and Facebook facilitates it because Facebook don't care. You advertise a fake product on Facebook. You rip the product ideas, the images and the artifacts off Etsy or off Kickstarter or off Indiegogo. The product in its real form is worth $200, $300, $400. You advertise it for $49.95. Someone comes to your site, tries to buy it. The credit card gets charged, but the goods never get shipped. And a few weeks later, you just shut down that domain, change your name, set up a new Shopify, and go again. That is called crime. It is profitable. And for the most part, people get away with it for an extended period because you... If you are doing your crime properly, then you are doing it below the threshold upon which the local authorities will get interested. However, if you are engaging in crime, I'm assuming that there will be a number of other parties who will express an interest in providing you with, how should we say, insurance purposes of various cost levels. It's worth noting that the one time someone did successfully rip off the world via iTunes, the original Flappy Bird game, the owner of that game, the creator of that game, got basically met in a dark alleyway a number of times, uh, metaphorically and not so metaphorically, and basically got beaten up for their lunch money, of which it was quite a considerable amount of lunch money, but they basically found that being a number one ranked game of dubious origin, dubious asset set, uh, attracted a set of attention from people who were even more dubious. So that's your functional financial and safety risk should you choose to go down the being a fake Shopify shop. <coughs> it's also worth noting that <coughs> On the consumer side, it's too damn easy to buy. Uh, Amazon has one click, and the fact that we have an entire genre known as drunk Amazon shopping, where you wake up the following morning with a bunch of purchase things in your email, and over the next six weeks, random boxes from Amazon arrive at your doorstep. It's too easy to do it. There should be a little more friction. Last thing on the non-financial price from the consumer perspective. If you are using a presumption perspective, time price is your biggest barrier to, you see something, it's perfect for the project you want to do, you hit the order button and your brain doesn't process that the shipping date says, we'll ship to you between June and November. I have objects that I ordered in the middle of first semester that probably won't arrive until the end of second semester for projects that hopefully I was going to have done before semester started. C'est la vie, such is online life. But considerations here as well. From a conceptual, theoretical and speak the marketing language perspective, if you have engaged in this approach during the semester, the whole of consumer behavior is wide open to you for purchase, purchase decision. Was it a high involvement, low involvement purchase? Involvement theory is important. There are a bunch of ways. Uh, I want to briefly just gloss past the distribution by physical object uh, element. I've mentioned Bandcamp. Um, digital tangible, video games, Steam, and convertible intangibles. Basically, we're back to classic. Once we're in physical objects, we're back to classic. There is no difference between mail order and online. But the one place where there's some interesting stuff being done is uh, Roll20, drive Through RPG, uh, and a few games um, on a few platforms, like there are a couple of games on Steam, where it's a mediated intangible of Roll20 hosts, role-playing games, where you buy virtual objects to use in a virtual environment of a virtual table. And these objects aren't cheap. But also, uh, you can then see a massive crossing of the streams when you can buy... On HeroForge, you can custom create your character through menu-based co-creation, export that to... purchase that for export to a virtual tabletop, 
and then use it in a virtual role-playing environment hosted on a computer to co-create a full virtual experience. The, the steps of co-creation, the cascading amount of co-creation that takes place there is amazing, and the mediated intangible is something that's well worth further exploring. All right, case studies. Etsy, I've mentioned it a few times on the way through. It's holding steady. Uh, it could be better. There was a big push at one point in time to... Etsy was under siege, basically, from mass manufacturing. Now, the thing about Etsy is it's supposed to be handmade or secondhand or upcycled. It's had less and less of the second hand of the antique, retro, and vintage because of the problems of fake products, of falsification. Um, handmade also was touch and go for a while there, where there was some very clearly automated production stuff happening. But equally, if you are offering 3D printed products, then really, who are you to say whether your work is handmade or not? Uh, so there's a bunch of things on there. From your perspective, if you have been using Etsy, there's a lot of interesting things to consider around the co-creation, uh, but also software as service, services marketing theory, and what role has Etsy played as a promoter versus a distributor? AliExpress, it is the physical object clearing house of all time. I've got to stop shopping there. It is the front end brokerage for the Alibaba Wholesale Exchange. So if you don't want to buy 15,000 lightsabers, I mean, I do, but I just don't have the money. Uh, basically, you go to Alibaba and you look around there, you find the product you want, then you go back to AliExpress and see if you can buy it at a reasonable rate. Alibaba.com also is where you can start doing some things like white label. Now, a white label production is where you buy an unbranded product. So, for example, a remote control drone can be sold unbranded, where you can then buy the minimum, say, it's usually about 1,500, 1,500 units worth of this, which you can then put your own custom box around. Uh, the company may provide the template for the box and make it a deal of, you, it's a white label. If they unbrand it, you can put your own brand on it, which means you can do it for um, then set up your Shopify account, set up your amazing high-tech digital brand account, and sell it through there. There are some challenges and problems there. Functionally, if you are using AliExpress, I would say the good odds are that you are probably consumer buying from it more than you are wholesale selling through it. But if you are using it as a brokerage and you are selling through there and you've got your account there, you are in a classic business to business working relationship. You should be thinking about B2B theory and you should be very much looking at what distribution channel uh, and also the marketing definition around stakeholders, uh, partners, create, communicate, deliver and exchange and offering that has value for partners because you are now working with a number of organizations for fulfillment, for supply, and you are a broker, and you are a business-to-business -business operative. eBay, um, this is an interesting platform because when it originated, it was a business, it was a consumer-to-consumer -consumer platform. Its purpose was brokerage. It ran as an auction house where consumers sold to other consumers. It has slowly and then very quickly shifted over to being a business to consumer platform where businesses sell to consumers. Occasionally, some people sell C to C, but it's even you now my family, uh, we were, we are still, we are hoarders and collectors. And at one point in the early 2000s, we decided to sell off the collections that were in our house. And it took five years of nearly daily eBay transactions. So I know a lot about drop. I know a lot about shipping, but not drop shipping. Uh, my parents would 
were on first name basis with the manager of the local Australia Post outlet because my father would show up there with 30 to 40 packages to shift and he became a VIP premium customer of the local post office. I didn't even know you had those. Functionally though, it took them, yeah, you know, whilst it took us uh, five to seven years to clear the house of stuff, and we never once bought new things to bring in, what happened over that period of time is that we saw the transition from eBay as a place where it was consumers like my parents selling to other consumers, probably like my parents, through to then the companies arrived, then Instead of us selling our secondhand Royal Dalton ceramic figurines that you know we were gifted as uh, for birthday gifts and Christmas gifts that we no longer wanted, and instead of me selling off my old Lego kits, suddenly Royal Dalton was selling Royal Dalton figurines on eBay alongside J Random parental unit selling them. So that pivot meant that you could buy. Uh, the buy it now was also a factor where it went from an auction house where you bid to a retail place where you bought. You, there still are points where you go bidding. There still are second-hand markets involved there, but there's a lot more. This is a grungy Amazon.com. Uh, also, the other thing about it is that this is where PayPal established a monopoly. Uh, the PayPal Mafia, who were responsible for eBay and the linkage of PayPal and eBay together, they are they should have been done for a bunch of crimes back in the day. They won't get done because they're too damn rich now. Uh, they'll die before they get uh, prosecuted. But basically, the way that PayPal established itself was on the back of the eBay being so successful as a global clearinghouse for secondhand goods it was proving to be difficult to pay. And also this was back in the day when international shipping was still good. That mailing things from Australia to Germany was feasible. Mailing things from America to Australia and Australia to America wasn't cost prohibitive. So we had a point where eBay had to either negotiate with a bunch of banks who didn't much like it or use their own transaction mechanism and PayPal grew from that. PayPal then promptly went and did a whole bunch of evil things along the way, but PayPal started there. Now I've mentioned Steam a couple of times, Valve Gaming, which has a major, major gambling problem and major issues with uh, microtransactions and will get regulated to hell very soon if they don't stop mucking about with encouraging underage gambling. Uh, it is a data set masquerading as a shop front. I've actually wanted to work for Steam for a while just to be able to see the data set that they've got behind the scenes on user behavior and user patterns. Uh, one of the things that fascinated me is that they had, at the peak of Team Fortress 2, there were heat maps of movement patterns throughout the game maps. And this is sort of the sheer volume of user data they had and behavioral data they had. These days, Steam is a shopfront and it is basically able to handle uh, wholesale, retail, and microtransaction. But what's really interesting is that it has a couple of tiers of transaction option. One of those is a community marketplace. So it's feasible for you as a small time operative who can create interesting add-ons, interesting modifications, skins, uh, alternate character skins, alternate weapon skins, content maps. It's feasible for you to then sell those in the Steam marketplace with the permission of the game maker and brokered through Steam. So relevant legals and permissions are handed off. Huge and underrated. Uh, as big and overrated as Valve is, the market space itself, I think, hasn't been fully explored. A lot of opportunities there in the future. But it's also a weird mix of deeply technical skills and hard, sharp business skills, which 
basically if you've got a mate who's doing um, comp science or you're in the IS major and you're doing the subject as well, you might go put a squad together and see what you can do in terms of looting the market there. Uh, it's also worth looking up the Spiffing Brit on uh, YouTube to see how he periodically breaks Steam and Steam's various features. Good lad, that uh, uh, Lord Spiffington. All right, final thing to talk about theory and application. Here's how it's going to go. Etsy. So this paper here, the one idea, again, a reminder why we're talking about these papers is getting you used to and comfortable with the idea that there is probably something written about the type of project you're working on. And then there is just the existence of the paper is a good start. You only need one idea from it. And the idea that I want to take out of this paper is when I read it, is the concept of slow fashion. Ethical, sustainable, slow production. This opens up the whole idea of authenticity, localism, exclusivity, premium, premium product, premium pricing, time price as a feature. And because it was talking about uh, fibre, and fibre comes from live animals, then you have these amazing exclusivity premium goods, premium packages that can come with this almost pre-made story. So if you, I mean, it's going to take a bit of infrastructure, but if you had a llama, llamas, if you were to go down this small fibre farm pathway, you could acquire a llama, sell llama fiber, but the llama itself becomes the story. The story of this llama, updates on the llama's health. How's the llama doing? What's the llama? Selfies with the llama. Llama takes its own selfies. You suddenly have this ability to create unique, distinctive, hard to replicate, story-driven premium products. And that's what's really interesting to me is an authentic, localized, exclusive product. It totally reimagines the way in which we can think about the internet as a mass brokerage platform, allowing people to sell micro-exclusive. Of course, the other thing I reckon is be really fun to go and do this the other way around and to be doing things around, say, 3D printing, where you basically treat your printer like the llama and give it a big story and make it a feature. So for me, this paper, slow fashion. Slow fashion gave rise to bespoke, handcrafted, story given, story driven, exclusive products in a mass market brokerage, which means it could justify a whole bunch of different ways of engaging with niche based Selective distribution, exclusive distribution, premium pricing. This is how you link it back to your other theories. Here is someone demonstrating that yes, this is feasible. Yes, this is being done. Therefore, it would support if you were to do a similar approach, but with a different product category using the compatible theories. And with that, if you need me, you know where to find me on the internet and that has been Markets and Marketplaces. Thanks for sticking through and listening to the show. And I will see you on the internet.